I think it was Scott Fitzgerald that said the no second acts. Well, this is a second act, and I'm very grateful for it because I wasn't very happy with what I did with the first act when I had the whole night to talk about a year and a half ago. And I talked about so many other things, I never got to what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> but since I'm an Episcopal priest, that is not unusual. That's not the first time that's happened. So I'm from Columbia. My family has been in Saluda since the 1870s. That's when the Shans got here. The Coleses came not long after that, so they've been around a while. For me, coming to Saluda was about going up. You went up into the mountains. Saluda is higher elevation than Columbia. That's why we're here. And the most impressive part of the trip was coming up. But those of you who are railroad people know that's not the most important part of a railroad story. Coming up the mountain is not the big deal. It's going down the mountain. And I, I'm serious about it. It's going down the mountain and doing that safely. Coming up, you know, you love to tell the stories about the, when the helper was here and the days when they would have to split the train up and bring half of it. That's all wonderful. Not a single one of those engineers thought that was a big deal. But everyone who got down to Matt Tryon stopped and thanked God he had gotten down. <laughs> That's the big story in railroad is going down the mountain. Well, in railroad lore, Pitt Ballou is remembered because one night he was taking a train down Saluda and it ran away. And he was the last person to get off the train. Southern Locomotive 440, Ballou was the engineer, departed Asheville with 11 cars of coal and two general merchandise cars. The last car was filled with eggs. Bear that in mind. No, I'm serious, filled with eggs. As the train crested the mountain, cresting is right across the street. Blue applied the brakes and realized from the faint hiss that he had lost his brake pressure. At the same time, the conductor in the caboose at the end of the train noticed the pressure gauge was pegged on zero. Ballou blew his whistle to have the brake men who were riding on the roof walks tie up the handbrakes. Now, in one of the other talks, the point was made that once that train began to move from just where Greenville Street is with a full load like that, it's estimated that in 60 seconds, the train is going 60 miles an hour. How fast did they want it to go? Eight. Eight miles an hour. Anything over eight when it got down where the, where, what I'm about to talk about was considered too fast. So once it gets going within a minute, it can be going as fast as 60 miles an hour. Well, very soon, Ballou realized this train was a runaway and yelled, I'm, I'm quoting now, yelled to the crew to jump and save their lives. The engineer and the fireman jumped and hurtled down a cinder-covered embankment. The conductor, realizing the train was lost, decided to separate the caboose from the train by pulling the coupling pin. When the conductor started pulling the pin, a brakeman who'd been on the roof jumped to the roof of the caboose. As his feet landed safely on the caboose, the conductor separated the hack from the train. The conductor and the brakeman were then able to apply the handbrake on the caboose, slow it to a halt, and begin calmly composing themselves. We just can imagine what that was like. <laughs> They heard the wreck a few minutes later, though, as the train crashed at the bottom of the mountain. 
The train of 13 cars was a total loss. That's not exactly true. Remember the eggs I mentioned? That was the one car that did not fall off the tracks. Must have been hard boiled eggs, I guess. <laughs> the train crew found engineer Ballou near death at the bottom of the embankment and in need of extensive medical attention. He had jumped, as he stayed on as long as he could. And when he finally got to a point, he hurled himself off down into the, into the cinders on the side. So he survived that. He lived long enough to get back in the, in fact, he lived long enough to get back behind the, the controls of a, of a locomotive later on, something maybe some of us might not have done. But he was put in the hospital in um, Asheville. While he was there, between July of 1903, within the next two months, there were two additional wrecks and more people were dead. I calculated that about 27 to 30 men, and there were all men in this case, died from the time the train started coming until 1903 when this wreck happened. About 30 people died on the Saluda grade. They were all, by the way, um, involved in freight trains. No passenger ever died on the Saluda grade. But at least 30 uh, railroad personnel did. While Ballou was in the hospital, one day the nurses heard him screaming out, I have it, I have it. This is part of the great story of Pitt Ballou. I just love that name, Pitt Ballou. <laughs> Pitt says, I have it, I have it. And they thought he was having a fit or something. They went in and he had figured out how to solve this problem. And what he wanted was to get somebody from the Southern Railroad to come, an engineer, and he told them immediately, he said, what we need to do is put tracks on the side in inclines that if the train is running loose, the track will send it up. Well, two of those were built. One was a little more than a mile away from here and the other was on down the road toward where Melrose is. At the safety tracks were little cabins and they had somebody in them 24 hours a day because the, when freight trains came wasn't predictable. What would happen is as the train went down the mountain, if the conductor thought it was under control as it neared the first safety track, he would send a certain signal on the, that horn that was terrifying you, that whistle. It was good news if it was sounded in the right thing. I think it was said to be two long and one short blast. Anything other than that meant the train was not in under con the control of the conductor. And here's the thing that I found, <laughs> I just was startled, startled by this. What we today would call the default position, that is, how were the tracks aligned? They were left with the expectation that the train was going to go up the safety track. If the control of, was sure and the conductor didn't need to do that and the whistle sounded, the switch that he threw pulled the track back and sent it on to the next safety track where the thing could be repeated, but probably if it was on right with the first one, it wasn't going to pick up that much speed with the second. So it, the key was the whistle sounding at the first, before it got to the first one and the, the safety track would be turned off and on down the road they could go. Now, from 1903 to sometime in the 1940s, I'm estimating, it depended entirely upon the whistle my experience was as a child in the 1950s when Doran Fisher was the station master. 
Doran and his cousin, Mr. Hall, were the, ran the railroads. Into that room where the bay window was came the telegraph, and the telegraph couldn't be heard, and so it was amplified, by, I'm not making this up, by a can of Prince Albert chewing tobacco. <laughs> Was stuck on, the, and that made it louder. But you also got telephones, messages could come in there. Of course, I had a phone here. And also radio. By this time, there were radios on there. But how they dealt with the um, side tracks, safety tracks, was from the late 1940s on until about 64, 1964, there was a telephone line, it's actually called a tie-down tie line. And it's just nothing but a, uh, I mean, imagine teenage girls. It's like a telephone that's always off the hook. It, that's all it was, was a microphone through a telephone line that was relayed here to, to that room. And in that room was the switchboard. The switchboard was probably, you know, you, my, my memory is, like anybody's memory, it's, the switchboard was probably not as big as I remember it being. But what it was was a box that looked like a filing cabinet, a stand-up filing cabinet, with little lines that began when the train was on the other side of the trestle at Lake Summit. And as the trains would come, you'd hear this click, 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 and this was inside, I mean, this was the, the quote, the computer. Um, and what it was doing was picking up electrical signals from the different tracks. And it would make lights come on and you could follow the progress of the train. And it had a place where there were two tracks up here through the town of Saluda. You could see where there were two tracks. You could turn the switchboard, it dealt with lights. And whether the train could, could go this way or it needed to hold up. And it would, again, it would make like that. Well, when the trains went down the mountain, as soon as they left here, and many of them were so long that they would stop here at the crest where they started going so you could see them and the, this depot had one of those um, don't any of you Florida fans now don't get excited if I'm doing this <laughs> you know remember the lights that were up at the top and and a, a thing would come down uh, and a light signal would come down and it would go back up and you could move that from in Doran's little room that stuck out here when the train went, you turned up the volume on this speaker and you waited and you waited and then you'd hear the horn. And when you heard the horn, if it was the right horn, you threw a little toggle switch and pushed a button under it and you would hear big clickety clack and the, it, you knew it was pulling the train track back to let it go. Now, I want to assure you that I never did this at, at the age of, Doran died when I was about nine. So let's say from six, seven, eight, nine, I was an employee of the Southern Railroad. <laughs> I, I got up and got here to be at work with him. I stayed down there. Every day we ate a slice of um, peach or pear with a little mayonnaise and a little crumbled up cheese. <laughs> that, was the, that was all he brought for lunch. Well, I thought that, well, that's what you had to eat if you were on the train. <laughs> and so you would um, wait for that sound, hear it over the radio, throw the switch right over in that room, and everything was supposed to work just fine. My godfather, Pickens Coles, gave me 1958, 
one share of stock in the Southern Railroad. That share of stock in 1958 was worth $50. I want to tell you, I, was, I thought I was rich. And every, we know when the little dividends would come out, you'd get about 75, 80 cents, something like that. I still have that. My broker in Columbia said, why don't you get rid of that? That's not producing anything. I said, look, you can sell anything you want. I'm going to keep my Southern Railroad stock till the day I die. It's split. I mean, I'm a big, big time dealer. Now, it's probably got 50 shares. Who knows? But it all came about from Saluda, and it all came about because of this room just on the other side of the tickets. One time, my mother had a friend who came up, and when she got off the train, she said, what did you, that was about eight, this is B candy. Said, what did you have to do with this train coming up? And I said, well, I threw the switches. Well, she just turned completely white. <laughs> well, she's already white. I mean, she turned whiter. She said, I need a drink right now. <laughs> this is talking about the end of passenger service to Saluda. Passenger trains operated safely over Saluda grade until December the 5th, 1968. In some 90 years of operations over Saluda grade, no passengers ever lost their lives. Fewer Southern employees lost their lives after Pitt Ballou's idea. But no passengers ever lost their lives. Well, someone from Saluda was quoted at this point after the last train left. I rode the last 28, train number 28, that's Carolina Special. I rode the last 28 that went down the grade she said, when that train got to Columbia, there wasn't a soul on that train but me and the crew. We missed those trains, she said. And that was Lola Ward. Aww. So I'll end with that. Ah!